Uh, okay, back to back to the story here. Uh, okay, again, public key cryptography, you have two keys, okay, and these keys come in pairs, okay, there's an, there's a, an encryption key and a decryption key, so I construct these two keys. Now, the encryption key, I can make that public, right, and anybody can take that encryption key and encrypt a message and send it to me. As long as I keep the decryption key private, I am the only one who can decrypt those messages, but anyone can encrypt so we've solved that problem, right? We don't need John Walker to distribute keys anymore. We can just make the public key, post it, make it public, and everybody can encrypt messages and send it to me. Wow, that's a big advantage here, right? Okay, we don't have to rely on dishonest people. Uh, it's not quite that easy. <laughs> we have a few issues uh, in practice, but you know, in principle, that's, that's a huge advantage. Uh, okay, now these things are based on a so-called trapdoor one-way function. Okay, trapdoor or one-way means it's something that's easy to compute in one direction but difficult to compute in the other. Okay, uh, an example would be uh, if you take two large prime numbers and you multiply those guys together. That's easy. Anybody can multiply two big numbers together. It doesn't matter how big they are. You can write a little program and it will multiply. Easy. However, if I give you the product, a big number, and I tell you it's a product of two large primes, try to factor it, that's a very hard problem as far as anybody knows. It's computationally a difficult problem. So that's kind of the one, an example of a one-way uh, function. Um, and that's what that says. Okay, the trapdoor business is you have to have some sort of trick to create the keys. Because after all, these keys have to be related to each other in some very special way, okay, in order to make one encrypt and the other decrypt. And you're making one of them public, right? So if someone could take that public key and derive the private key from it, you'd be hosed, okay? This thing would not work, okay? So there's gotta be some sort of trick involved there, okay? Um, Okay, now, just one more thing here. With this public key stuff, now, if we, if we were to do chapter six in the book, um, which is about uh, cryptanalysis, and mostly about block ciphers, if we were to do that chapter, you know, you guys, you could design a sort of very plausible block cipher. It's really not that hard to come up with a block cipher that's probably, you know, it's probably not that great as far as efficiency and stuff like that, but it's probably pretty hard to break in practice. So it's a practical matter. You could probably construct a, you know, plausible block cipher. Not that anybody would use it, Kirchhoff's principle and all that, but, you know, in, in reality, you probably could. On the other hand, if I asked you to come up with the, you know, your own public key crypto system, good luck. <laughs> Okay, these things do not grow on trees. Okay, there just are not that many of them out there, and there are even fewer that ever get used in practice. So they're very special things. They have to be constructed very carefully, and all the math has to just sort of work out just right to make these things work. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, the keys come in pairs, as all this is saying. So you encrypt. And for some reason, in public key, the, the plain text is usually given as M, the message, instead of P. I don't know. So we'll follow that convention. So we encrypt M, and then we encrypt the public key. We decrypt uh, the ciphertext with the uh, private key. So that's pretty straightforward, encrypt, decrypt. This is maybe a little less obvious, the idea of a digital signature. So you can take the private key. So I could take my private key, and I could encrypt the message with my private key. Now, who could decrypt? Everybody, because the public key is, who knows the public key? The public, okay, and that's everybody. Okay, so everybody knows the public key. So anybody can decrypt. So what good is it to encrypt a message that anybody can decrypt? That's kind of what it is. Authentication. I mean, like, it's from an authentic source. Uh, we we'll, can use this in an authentication protocol. We'll actually talk about that. That's true. But sort of more, you know, basic is that I'm the only one who could have done that, right? It's like my signature, right? I'm signing this document. I'm the only one who could sign this document, at least in principle. I'm the only one who could have put that mark onto that particular document because I'm the only one who has the private key. And by using the public key, you can verify that I actually put, that I actually did that. Yeah. Could you add some, 
Could it add some measure of integrity by making it harder for people to? Uh, we'll see. We can actually use this as a form of integrity as well. Yeah, but it, we have to do a little more work to do that. So yeah, you guys are right. It's good. Authentication and integrity. Wow, you're getting ahead of the game here. <laughs> okay, but it, think of it like a handwritten signature, only much better. Okay, it's much stronger in the sense that it's tied into all the bits of the document. You can't like photocopy the signature off. It's easy to verify, okay? It's not like I need a handwriting expert to verify, so it's got very nice properties, okay? Uh, okay, I think we got enough time. Okay, so Knapsack crypto system. This is the first, this is, so okay, the history. We need a little history on public key cryptography. Um, this is just, to me, is really a fascinating area because what happened is there's kind of a secret, you know, spy inside, you know, government uh, history of public key cryptography. And then there's an outside academic uh, development of public key cryptography, and the parallels are just striking, okay? What happened is the very first person to really think of this was a, a guy who worked for GCHQ, which is the British equivalent of NSA, okay? So they, they developed ciphers for the British government. Um, he was just sitting around kind of daydreaming, okay? <laughs> he wrote this paper, and this was like in the late 60s. Uh, he wrote this paper saying, you know, there's nothing about cryptography that really says that, that the only way you can do this is to have a symmetric key. It should be possible to have something different to encrypt than you use to decrypt, okay? And then we could make one of these guys public and keep the other one private. He said, in principle, that should be possible, but I don't know how to do it. Okay, well, a couple years later, some guys came along and figured out a way to do it, okay, also at GCHQ. I mean, this was all their top secret, you know, held very tightly sort of stuff. They figured out how to do this, okay, you could do this based on some algorithm that used factoring, okay. Okay, so that was like early 70s, like 1970 or something. These people had kind of figured this out. They didn't really know what to do with it. It just seemed like a mathematical curiosity, and they just kind of kept it and you know, it was there, but, you know, nobody really did anything with it. Okay, now in the outside world, uh, like the mid-70s, uh, you guys read the paper in 265, I guess. Diffie and Hellman wrote this paper, right, New Directions in Cryptography. And basically what they said is, you know, it should be possible to, you know, encrypt the messages with one key and decrypt with a different key, and then you can make one of them public and keep the other one private, but we don't really know how to do it. <laughs> And then like a year later, well, shortly thereafter, people came up with this knapsack system, which ultimately proved to be insecure. But a year or so after that, people came up with a concrete means of encrypting, and it involved a system that used factory. It was basically the same system, these people despising it. And it was completely independent of each other. And you know, almost the same time, just, you know, it's just kind of amazing. Okay, anyway. Uh, the knapsack, okay. Uh, this is uh, really the first practical public key crypto system that people <coughs> proposed, okay. Uh, and you can go back and look. There are all kinds of patents filed on this, and people set up companies that were going to make them billions of dollars and all this stuff, and ultimately it proved to be insecure. But it's nice in the sense that it's sort of first, and you can sort of see all the parts that go into building a public key system. So I think it's a good one to, to look at. Okay. So it's based, all public key systems are based on some hard mathematical problem. Okay, that's got to be the basis. Okay, here the hard mathematical problem is known as the knapsack problem. Okay, it goes like this. What we've got is a set of n weights, okay? And really, they're just numbers, okay? W0 through Wn minus 1. And we're given a sum, S. And the question is, can you find a subset of these guys that add up exactly to S? That's all it's saying. This is kind of the formal way to say it, right? Can you find a set of zeros and ones so that when you add this up, you get S? What does it mean, zeros and ones? If it's zero, you don't select that weight. If it's one, you do select that weight. So that's all that's going on. It's just a formalization. Okay. 
Um, now, technically, if you look this up like in a combinatorial algorithms book or something like that, they'll call it a subset sum. The, the knapsack actually involves a little bit more than this. But for cryptographers, this is the knapsack, so we'll call it the knapsack. Okay, so here's an example. So suppose I give you this set of weights, you're given the weights, and I give you a sum, right? 302. And I say, can you find a subset of these guys that adds up exactly to 302? And you say, yes, because it's right here on the slide. Okay, so that was easy. Uh, suppose it wasn't here on the slide. How would you find such a subset? Try all possible subsets. Brute force, right? Exhaustive search. Try all possible subsets. How many weight elements do we have here? Looks like we've got eight elements in our set. So how many subsets are there? Two to the eight, right? How many binary strings of length eight, right? There's two to the eight. Try all of those, zeros and ones, right? Tell you which ones to select and which ones not to select. Two to the eight, that's small, that's easy. You could try them all and see if any of them add up to 302 and you'd be done. Well, suppose there's 100 elements in my subset, in my set, right? What are you gonna do then? And I give you a sum. How are you gonna break that? I don't know, but you're not gonna do an exhaustive search, okay? I guarantee you, two to the 100, you're never gonna do that. Okay, and in fact, this general knapsack problem, just given a random set of weights and given a sum, uh, is known to be NP-complete. Now, what does it mean for a problem to be NP-complete? Yeah, something like that. I mean, for our purposes, let's keep it simple. NP complete means it's really hard. <laughs> okay, so it's a really hard problem to solve. There's no efficient algorithm to solve this particular problem, as far as anybody knows. Okay. So that's good as a basis for building a, 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 a crypto system. The goal here would be to make an attacker solve this NP complete problem, okay, but give the encryptor and decryptor enough information that they don't have to work that hard. Okay, so that's kind of the goal. Can we cook things up so that that sort of thing happens? 